To learn how to program, we're using the Python computer language. There are a lot of different computer languages. And what even is a computer language? Why do we care? Why are there so many of them? And how do they work? To begin with, to understand computer languages, we need a little bit of history of programming to understand where we've come from. In the beginning, one of the first personal computers is shown right here, the Altair 8800. And this was an incredibly wonderful computer, but very much unlike any of the computers that we use today. This computer has no screen, no printer, no keyboard. What we worked with was just this front panel display that we've got right here. And the front panel worked something like this. You entered the data simply by flipping these switches up front. And once you flip the switches up front with the data that you wanted, which would represent a number, you would press the switches down here in order to tell the computer what to do with it. So you would flip these switches, hit these, flip these some more, hit these. And if you made any mistake, there was no going back and redoing it. If somebody tripped over the power cord, there was no disk drive to load your program again. You just sort of cried and started over. This computer, though, was the first type of computer that a person could actually buy and have in their house. And in order to understand programming languages, we have to realize that even the computers today basically work this same way, but just have a whole lot of things added on to them to make the whole interface a lot nicer. So to understand what's going on beneath the hood, we need to be able to understand a little bit of what's going on here. So how do we go from flipping switches to entering data? Well, computers work all with ones and zeros, which you've probably heard before, but what exactly does that mean? Well, that works with the fact that there's a whole numbering system based upon ones and zeros, and it converts to our regular decimal number system, and there's also a hexadecimal number system. Now, the whole concept behind those numbering systems you can see in the video right here. I highly recommend that you watch that, but we're not gonna go over that particular numbering system right now because we're more interested in the computer language part as opposed to the numbering system. Once you've got particular numbers like these assigned to commands, we used to just enter the numbers themselves and the computer would run. That was not very easy. We want an easier way to enter computer programs. The next step up a second generation programming language. The first generation was you just entered numbers and the computer ran those numbers to do your program. Not very easy. The second generation was using assembly language programming. And this chart right here shows how assembly language programming works. The things that the user typed in when they were programming are all over here on this side. This is what the user typed in. What the user typed in would then get translated, such as this would be a command, and it would translate into hexadecimal numbers over here. So the person didn't have to type in 8613. Remember that 86, for instance, stood for LDA. The person didn't have to remember that. They had a much easier mnemonic to remember LDA in order to load a particular register rather than typing in 86. Over here happens to be the memory addresses. This is where in the computer memory this particular program was stored. So this was a lot easier. You could type in something like this in order to get the numbers that you needed for your program. This was easier to read and understand and was a huge improvement from what we had before. But as you can probably see looking at it, this still isn't the easiest type of program to work with. Even adding numbers or multiplying numbers takes several different steps. It's not just a matter of entering an asterisk to get a multiplication sign. An improvement of that, the third generation languages, which is the type of language that Python is, COBOL, Fortran, a whole bunch of other types of languages improved upon that in order to create some sort of structure behind it. This language, we still needed to go from whatever we typed in into these numbers. So the way that worked is like this. What the user types in is called the source code. And then we need to take that source code and convert it to machine code. There's a separate program that a person runs called a compiler that takes what the user typed in, runs it through a compiler, and then you get the machine code. After this, we have the machine code, and 
A user can run the machine code, but if you have a really large program, you might have several different files that make up your entire program. Rather than one huge, long, million-line file, you'll have quite a few different files in order to organize it. You have another file with source code in it. You run it through a compiler, and you've got machine code. Now you've got two different machine code programs. You run it through a linker, so all your different machine code programs run into a linker and you've got a final program. The neat thing about running programs this way is that the only thing you need to give as your final product that we actually give out is the result of all of this type of stuff that we've done. The source code or into the compiler, the machine code, the linker, and what we can give out is a final program. It only contains the machine code. We don't have to give out our source code. We don't have to worry about people stealing the source code and modifying our program quite so easily as it would be if they had the source code. And all we have to do is final machine code. It's a small program that we end up redistributing. This works fairly well and is particularly nice. But there are some advantages and disadvantages to doing this. First off, anytime you change your program, you have to run all of this stuff right here in order to get your final program. You decide you want to change a misspelled word or something like that, you got to run through all of this and then finally run your program again. Plus, final programs work differently on an Apple Mac, a Linux computer, a Windows computer, those final programs aren't, you can't take one of those and move it onto another computer and still run it without some sort of special software in order to emulate and make that computer pretend it's another machine. A way around that is instead of to use a compiler and to create machine code is to use an interpreter. So this is really similar to if you wanted to translate something from Russian to English perhaps, you've got two ways of doing it. First off, you could have it all written out in Russian, hire a translator, convert it to English, and then you've got your final English document, and it's everything you need. You don't need to worry about the Russian. You don't need to worry about in interacting with the interpreter. You've got your final English document in the language that you want to read. By using an interpreter, instead of having that main Russian document, one line of Russian goes to the interpreter, you hear that one particular line. If you need to communicate back, you can communicate in English, go through the interpreter, go back to Russian, and so forth. Instead of working with a compiler where everything happens to begin with before the user even gets the program, in this case it's a live document where everything is changed on the go. I can modify the source code and immediately run it through the interpreter. I don't need to compile step, I don't need a link step, I can work straight with my machine. The disadvantage of working this way is that if I want to give my program right here to somebody else, I also need to ship the interpreter. So if I have a very small program, I still have to ship an entire interpreter right along with my program. There are pluses and minuses to working both ways. In this case, Python works mainly as an interpreted type of language but on occasion it'll actually try to do a little bit of compiling just to make the program run faster. Compiled languages typically run faster than interpreted languages because you don't have this intermediary step to go in between. Okay, so what does this mean for us? It means that whenever we take our Python programs that we write in this class, if we want to give it to somebody else, we also have to give out an interpreter and it makes distributing the programs a little bit more difficult. We're not going to go into detail about that right now, but just know that it is something you have to consider. There are a lot of other languages out there. There's Python, PHP, C. They all specialize for different types of things. In fact, you can even see different languages and the popularity. I've got a link here in the book, and it talks about what languages are currently most popular and which are trending up and which are trending down. For example, right now, C is very popular. Java is also very popular, and C++, which is related to C. C is a great language for programming operating systems or any embedded programming. So dishwashers, cars, they all actually run programs. They'll typically be done in C. Objective-C would be the types of stuff you would do for the Apple Macintosh, iPhone, iPad. C Sharp is Microsoft specific. PHP is a great tool to use for programming interactive web pages and so forth. So you can see Python right now is ranking at about 8. Uh, Visual Basic is trending up pretty fast for some strange reason. 
there are a lot of lesser known programming languages down here below and you can see basically how these rate. A lot of these are fairly old languages that are not as popular as they once were. If you want to know more about the history of computers, there are a couple really great videos and a good book that do an excellent job of explaining how all of this works. So I highly recommend checking out Triumph of the Nerds and Nerds 201. These are great videos. They're entertaining and you can even watch them with the entire family. My wife and kids even enjoy watching these particular videos. This book, if you prefer book form, the Accidental Empires book is a great book to get even more detail than what's in the video and have an idea of where all of this different type of computer applications and computer programming languages actually came from. It's a very interesting, very conflicted, and very competitive history.